It is indeed fortuitous that today the weather is beautiful, for today is the day. It's the end of the Christmas season. Today is the day to take down all the Christmas decorations. And if your tree hasn't already turned into an amazing fire hazard, it's time to take that down too. We had to take ours down a few days ago because every time you looked at it, you could tinkle, 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 tinkle of all the, the needles going down. But yeah, the 12 days of Christmas, uh, they count from the 25th, first day of Christmas. The last day of Christmas was yesterday, and today is Epiphany. And so we're here on the, the, the brink, where we, we're wrapping up the Christmas season, and we're, and we're heading into what comes next. And so in, in this brink, uh, this, this cusp in between these two times, I want to take one last look back and remember how John looks at Christmas and then look to where we are today, Epiphany, and looking forward. What happens with uh, John is, is different than most of the time when we read about Christmas, we're looking at Matthew and Luke because they, they're giving us close-up stories, mangers and shepherds and angels. They're giving us kind of a tight focus uh, approach to telling the story. John does it differently. He pulls way back, and he's the one who tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Like This is a kind of a big cosmic view of all creation, that all of reality was created through the action of God and Jesus Christ. And so... John is trying to use these words to explain something mystic and something beyond comprehension. And uh, what John tells us, and what we just heard a minute ago at the end of the middle of the first chapter of John, is that the Word becomes flesh and lives amongst us. John 1.16, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And this gets at the, the logic of what happens. In Christmas, what we are celebrating, and in, in this is sort of uh, John's point of view, this is a huge cosmic point of view, is that we don't know God until God takes a huge step towards us. Right? We don't know who God is until Jesus comes to us, for only, uh, it is only the Son who knows the Father's heart has made him known. And so as we come to the Christmas season, like if you want to summarize Christmas in one broad stroke, one way to do it is to say Christmas is when God came towards us. One big step towards us. And we're, we're looking at Epiphany right now. Epiphany is the story of some number of wise men. There were three gifts, so we assume there are three wise men. There could have been seven. We don't know. But uh, some number of wise men, they're taking their own step towards God. They're taking this journey tor towards God. And so God acts first, taking a huge step towards us. And these wise men are responding and taking a journey of their own. And, and this is when things start to get really interesting, because then the wise men show up and, and Herod gets angry and scared and, and the world starts to intrude, so to speak. As I ponder these passages, it is interesting to think about the space that is in between. Like, the, as God takes a step towards us, that's great. Right? As the Magi are, are, are leaving their what's comfortable and they're, they're heading towards God, there, there's a whole group of people who are in, in neither category. Right? They're just... They are in, they're in the gulf in between. They're full, there's a gulf of people who have not experienced God's reaching for them. They have not been caught up with a desire to go find God. There are people who are living their lives apart from the church, the church being the vehicle God has chosen to be the vehicle for the doing of God's will. And so, as Christmas comes to a close, I wonder about these folks, these folks who are sort of in the middle, who are the people who need an epiphany. Right? There are people people who, who need to realize that they are loved by God. And, and there are people, the people who most need the epiphany of how, how much God loves them are, are by definition not you. Have you ever hear the term preaching to the choir? Uh, hello choir, right? You're here. Right? You are here, which means that at, later in the service you are going to hear that God loved you so much that he died on the cross for you and that in the name of Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Right? You are going to receive again the gift of this table where God, Jesus says, this is my body is broken 
broken for you. You are loved, right? You're going to hear yet again that you are loved and you are forgiven and you are accepted and then go love on each other as we create peace, we pass peace amongst each other, right? Every Sunday, hopefully, is a reinforcement of the epiphany that you have each had that God would do anything to get to you and has and has died out of love for you, right? You know that, hopefully. And if not, come here and let's drink, let's drink some coffee. Like, I, I can tell you the story again. Right? You, you get it. You're here. Hello, choir. Right? There are a lot of people who are not here and, and, and are the ones who, who need, like the people who drive by the church on Sunday morning and they're going to go do their thing somewhere else. They, what do they think, right? They're the ones who, they're to, I believe that you hear the phrase, wise men still seek him, right? It is still wise to, to be like the Magi and, and be turning to, responding to God, taking a step towards us in response and taking a step towards God. And, and there are many who are not. And what do they see? What do they think? What do they observe as they drive by the church on a Sunday? And I think that uh, what we're grappling with is there's a challenge here because there's a, there's a break in, in age. There, there is a generation in which the church, to, to invite people of prob about 40 and older to church, there's a positive association with church there. And so the argument is not, you should come to church. It is that this church is well run, right? The people are already open to the idea of church, an older generation. And so the argument is not, you should come to church at all. It's that this church is in good shape. It's a great place to be. Oh, that's interesting. Let me show up and be part of that. For people under 40, it's a little bit different. And I realize this as I... Uh, there's a group called Barna that does research, statistical demographic research, for the, the purposes of the church. And, and they did a survey, uh, it's been six years ago now they did this survey, of uh, people in 16 to 29, so now these folks would be mid-20s to mid-30s. And it looked at how people, these young adults, uh, people under the age of 40, and I'm right there on the cusp, just in case you're wondering, I'm about, about to turn 39, so this is barely me, um, how they see the church. And, and all these numbers have a 5 to 6% margin of error, just to be clear about my, my margin of error here. But if you look at adults under the age of 40 and how they see the church, what gets in the way of them joining the wise men and coming to receive this good news? Well, here's part of it. 70% of adults under the age of 40 see the church as insensitive. 75% see the church as too political. 78% see the church as out of touch with reality. 85% see Christians as hypocritical. 87% see Christians as judgmental. 91% see Christians as homophobic. And so this is how non-Christians under the age of 40 see the, the church. And this is a problem. This is a challenge. And, and this survey wasn't just a, of non-Christians. It was also of Christians under the age of 40. And it, the numbers there are, are challenging as well because Christians, people who are in church in worship right now, uh, under the age of 40, according to this study, 80% of them see the church as homophobic. 52% see the church as judgmental. 47% see the church as hypocritical. And so there's this challenge. When I, when I go out and I see folk and I talk to people, um, I'm a pastor. You may have noticed this, right? And most people seem to realize it fairly quickly. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll chat with people and I'll say, let's drink coffee. Like, this is my default mode of life. If, if there's a problem, my response is, let's drink coffee. Anything, anything that comes up, I want to drink coffee because that's how you solve a problem. You sit down and you drink some coffee. And uh, unless something is bleeding or there's water spurting, we have time to drink coffee about it. And, and it, I'll ask people to come drink coffee with me. And... Um, or I'll go to you. And, and I, I never hear about it directly, but I hear about it like roundabout ways. I'll hear that people are worried that like I'm going to drink coffee with them and I'm going to, you ever heard the term Bible thump? Like I'm going to start Bible thumping them. <laughs> Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know where you're going to go when you die? Right? And people start like, dude, I just want to drink coffee. Like, but this sort of, right? I, I just, that's not how I roll, but that is how... People under the age of 40, adults under the age of 40, are seeing the church, judgmental, hypocritical, and, and, and just... Huh. So, upon hearing this, there's a pastor named Andy Stanley. He's over in Atlanta, and the way he responds to this, I, I agree with. He says, 
If we were to rewrite the script for the reputation of Christianity, I think we would put the emphasis on developing relationships with non-believers, serving them, loving them, and making them feel accepted. Only then would we earn the right to share the gospel. Only then. I agree with him. There are a large percentage of people that we meet every day that need to experience an epiphany. They need to experience and realize that what the church has to offer is the very news of salvation. That what the Magi are doing, seeking the good news, even though they don't fully understand it, that this is wise. This is what we need to be doing in life, seeking out the good news. Right? There are many people who have not considered looking to the church because of how they see it. And this was, a, this was an epiphany on my part, right? To realize that there are many who see the church not as I see it. I see it as a place of safety and comfort, and not perfect by any means, but as a place of hope and of, of grace. And in this uh, time, there are people who do not see the church as a place of good news, but see the church as uh, judgmental and, and hypocritical. As we leave Christmas this year, as we leave behind the warms and the fuzzies of Christmas, and as we go through Epiphany into the, the beginning of the new year and things start to ramp up, I think we need to acknowledge that the church in America has an image problem with adults under the age of 40, and I think it gets in the way of people who might otherwise join the wise men in coming to find Jesus. I think we need to engage this because we cannot assume that we are viewed in a positive light. And I think the way we begin this is by listening to those who are not in the church and asking them what they think. Right? Uh, it may be that for others, people outside the church to accept what we offer, that first we need to know what they think. Right? Who here knows someone under the age of 40? I don't count. I'm, I'm a pastor. Anyone, who here knows someone under the age of 40? Seriously, raise your hands. Right? You probably have some kids or grandkids or great-grandkids who count as that. Here's my uh, suggestion. Right. The way that these challenges are faced are by, not by big programs. Like, I don't have a program for you. I don't have some sort of book to read. I don't have anything complicated. Here, here's, here's how we engage those challenges. Can you go to someone under the age of 40 and ask them two questions? What do you think of the church? And what do you believe about God? And then listen. <laughs> I, is this doable? Is this hard? Is, is this a hard request? Is this possible? Right? I, I think so. But what do you think about the church? And what do you believe about God? And, and then the most important part then is to listen. Because if we are going to help people have the epiphany they need, we need to hear them first. Right? And this, again, as Andy Stanley puts it, we, if we were able to rewrite the script for the reputation of Christianity, I think we would put the emphasis on developing relationships with non-believers. Serving, loving, and making them feel accepted, only then would we earn the right to share the gospel. The only person who wants to listen to us is someone who we have already listened to. You, you may have noticed this, right? First listen, and then, then, then we might be able to speak later. And, and I don't have, as I said, I don't have a grand plan. If you, I, I hope you go out and do this. I hope that at some point this week you find the time to, as you're speaking to family or friends, someone who is uh, 40 or under, um, that you, when you ask this question, like, what do you think of church? What do you, what do you believe about God? I, I don't know what you should do in response. I, I think just listen and be willing to listen. And trust that the Holy Spirit is going to move, and that if three magi, or some number of magi, were able to read a text, uh, read a scripture in a language that wasn't their own, to seek a king that's not in their kingdom, uh, and, and seek a God that was not their God, if they were able to get through all those burdens and then travel for two years to get there, right, I, I think that that same spirit is capable of grappling with the challenges that any, one of, any person that we talk to, I, I think the spirit is willing to, is able to work through those. Any challenges anyone else faces as well. As Christmas ends, as we look towards Epiphany, as we look towards what happens next through this new year as we get started, as we look out to those who seek Jesus, it is my prayer and my hope that we might be able to guide more people to Jesus this year. And it is my conviction that it begins not by telling people what we believe, but by beginning to, by listening to what they think. Amen.